This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 32. Hi there, and welcome to another quick hit episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. Today's episode is a gathering of our resident gun cranks, myself, publisher Roy Huntington, and American handgunner editor Tom McHale, as we discuss the best and worst holsters for handgun carry. But before we get started, I'd like to remind you this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast is sponsored by our friends at Kimber. Kimber was founded with the singular purpose of making every firearm the best it can possibly be with a fit and finish that only practiced hands can achieve and appreciate. Whether you carry a Kimber for personal protection, hunting, or competition, know that their promise of quality without compromise is how they measure success. To learn more about Kimber firearms, visit KimberAmerica.com. In today's episode, we cover the worst and best in holsters, how to pick the right holster for your needs, and what makes a great holster great. It just so happens that Tom McHale actually wrote the book on selecting holsters, so he definitely has some pretty strong and good ideas. Now here's our Guns Magazine podcast quick hit episode on the best holster for you. Today, we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of holsters. Uh, That's all we're going to talk about. We're not going to reference anything else going on. We're just going to have a little fun and talk about the good stuff in holsters. So I'm going to start this out by saying, first of all, a holster is mandatory equipment for a handgun, whether you're just out target shooting or especially if you're carrying a pistol for defensive reasons, you got to have a holster and you shouldn't scrimp on that particular piece of it. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of folks do. So, so Roy, I'm sure you've seen a lot of crazy stuff in holster land. Well, you know, I wrote the handgun leather column in Handgunner for about 10 years and uh, that was the time where it was mostly leather. It was a uh, Kydex was being introduced and everyone lost their mind over that. But, <laughs> but I think there's a couple things you need to remember is first of all, is do you need a holster? First of all, yes. You know, obviously just cause you buy a gun, if you're not going to carry it or something, maybe you don't need a holster. But as Brent says, if you're going to the range, if you're in the field, if you're carrying a gun, for goodness sakes, you do definitely have to have a, um, a holster of some kind. And we can talk about the specifics of that. But I, somebody told me something one time, and I think it was Clint Smith. Uh, it was at the beginning of a class. And he said, he said, you think of a holster like you think of the sling on your rifle. Uh, he said, you know, if you have a rifle or a shotgun, especially a defensive gun, you should have a sling on it because you need to put it someplace when, like Ren said, when you're helping your kids out the front door or holding down the bad guy or something. And that I think people forget that they, they, they think they feel really good. Oh, I got my defensive gun in my hand, but now suddenly you have to put the fire out or you have to open the car door. Or you have to pull the bleeding guy away from something. And that's why most successful modern day inside the waistband holsters tend to be reinforced around the mouth of the holster just for that reason. But you guys need to back up though, because there's, you're, you're talking about one thing. I mean, I think, um, and, and Roy, nothing personal, but I wrote a whole book on holsters. So yes, just he saying, did. Just yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah. I was going to get a shameless plug in there for you, but you beat me to it. <laughs> but yeah. you beat us to your own shameless plug. <laughs> no, we, we can talk about that for an hour or so later, but um <laughs> But, but I think you got to think of three things, you know, why do you need a holster and why do you need a good holster? Uh, one, it protects the trigger from moving period. Yeah. That's, that's number one. Number two, it keeps your gun attached to you, to your body. And part three or reason number three is it keeps your gun oriented in a consistent position. So if, and when you need to go use it, you not only know exactly where it is, you know exactly how it's oriented. So when you grab it without looking, it's going to be there and ready for you. So, I mean, those are kind of the three criteria that I would look at for, for any holster choice. It's a good point because I know a lot of women, uh, we've addressed this many times through the years, uh, take a gun, drop it in their purse. And, you know, they always say, oh, well, I know where it is and stuff. But what you just said is so important because the grip gets flipped up, down, sideways, backwards. You reach inside, you can't find it. The same thing happens when you put a gun in a, a coat pocket. 
We've all had yep. that happen. You stick it in your pocket to take the trash out and you reach in later, you realize, oh, the muzzle's now pointing up. Well, where's, where's the weight in this, right? Yeah. It's just a semi-automatic pistol. All the weight is right here when it's loaded. So guess what's going down, right? Well, you know, and that's why I have this little 380 that I carry in my pocket all the time. But that, that you're right, the shape of that is pocket shaped. And so it tends to keep it vertical in your pocket. You're exactly right. Very important. And, and Tom makes such a great point about retention. We can tell, I'm sure we can all maybe tell a story, but I definitely can. Being in a foot pursuit and things are getting dicey and you kind of check to see where your gun's at, make sure it's there. And, oh, it's not there. That's not a real good feeling. You know, just one quick thing. I was in a roll around fight with a guy one day on duty in my duty holster, the an old judge holster. Remember the old ancient mm-hmm. Bianchi judge holsters, break front holsters? It's a wonder we're still alive. Uh, <laughs> but fights all over and I feel the tap on on my shoulder, my you know side. And I look over and there's this little kid about eight years old. He's got my revolver holding it by the grip. And he wow. goes, sir, <laughs> this fell out. <laughs> and it was like, it was a little True story. Absolutely yeah. true hey, story. Hey, yeah. miracles like that can happen. I, um, many years ago, I was wearing one of these um, compression undershirt, you know, with the, the holster pockets right here. And this was an early model before they got real aggressive with the Velcro and everything. And if you think about Kydex weight plastic on slippery plastic shirt material, hold that thought for a second. I was actually wearing this under a regular t-shirt with a you know, regular crew collar, not not something like this. I bent down to the ground to pick something up just from a standing position. And at the time I was carrying a Glock 32 loaded. So it was reasonably heavy. That thing ejected from this pocket through the collar and onto the ground at warp 17. Oh no lie. I mean, I'm sitting wow. there bent over. I didn't even feel it go. It just went <laughs> <laughs> like that. Oopsie. I'm looking at my Glock on the ground in front of my face going, oh my gosh, that's. He, he was in line to Jack in the Box too. So there was a pregnant pause in conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll throw out the discussion question that we'll try to keep this to under like 45 minutes. Kydex or leather? Yes. Yeah, I, was, I would agree with that. For me, it's mm-hmm. seasonal though. For me, I'm leather in the winter because I live in I live in 300% humidity here in South Carolina. So I do find that in the hot and sweaty months, uh, the leather gets a little sticky. Um, not just comfort for me, but for the gear inside. So, uh, you know, drawing a, a gun or a magazine isn't nearly as smooth, you know, when it's when it's 98 degrees outside and everything's soaking wet. So I, I kind of switched to Kydex in the summer. I think what Tom said was very important. I find the Kydex tends to be more snicky, you know, and more precise. And so if yeah. especially all my range holsters are Kydex holsters because you're in and out, in and out, they stay where they are. They click when the gun goes in, they pretty much don't wear out. But I think leather just, it's almost like good wine and a nice leather holster. And so I oftentimes yeah. I'll carry leather just for the mood more than anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Like your Rosen holster, you know, they're just so pretty. Yeah. I, I just yeah. want to have one. <laughs> I feel better, yeah. faster, stronger, smarter, and wealthier when I wear this holster. <laughs> this, this, um, I, I think maybe it's just a, a class, you know, a classy pairing. This is a DeSantis holster. This is for my Walther PPKS. So they just, you know, it just seems to work, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's it, they. I'll tell you what, though, they do wear out. And and I know I see holsters uh, on readers. You know, they'll send me a picture of a holster that they've had. You know, hey, I've had this holster for twenty years. It's like really, you should have thrown it away about eighteen <laughs> years ago. You know, yeah. they're soft. They're they're wear out. The snaps break, and these people keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And they're just that's crazy. Uh, you know, I want to show one more thing, which is a lot of people don't carry ankle holsters. This is a surgical elastic. It's got uh, sheepskin on the back. It's called a renegade. It's made by the Wilderness Tactical. The link mm-hmm. will be down below. And that's probably the world's most comfortable and secure ankle holster. But that's a yeah. mode of carry that people forget about. They think holsters and they think hip carry. But, yeah. you know, if you've got a small frame revolver or a small to medium size auto, ankle carry is a real viable option for you. Uh, it's a good idea. Or if you're in the car a lot, you spend a lot of time sitting, you know, yeah. in a vehicle, it's, it's very accessible that way. 
But yeah. don't wear it with shorts, okay? Just <laughs> would you do me that favor because I've actually seen that in open carry pictures. <laughs> Are you serious? I know. <laughs> I was going to say, but you at least have to have black socks and sandals on, right? Well, yeah, I, I mean, know. So it matches. Right? It's like what? It's like I saw that picture of the people at Walmart, and they've got the what's the bag when you're you're? It's like a urine bag that they clamp to your thigh, right? And so th- he had that on. Yeah, with shorts on. And I thought, you know what, that's, I mean, that's what you would look like if you wore ankle holstery. So just don't go there. So don't go there. And then now let's talk about how much money you should spend for a holster. Mr. Man who wrote the book about holsters. Talk to us about that. A lot, a lot. And I I don't mean that flippantly. So think about it this way. The best gun in the universe and all the training mean absolutely nothing if your holster fails because it's cheap or old or worn or whatever, right? I mean, would you would you put synthetic uh, used grease fuel in a Bugatti, you know? No, you put premium gas well, in it. Brentwood. Same, same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, I wouldn't now. See, that's right. where I think I'm qualified to talk about a lot of this stuff. I've made every single possible mistake you can humanly make. I'm the yep. perfect example of a bad example. That box of yep. holsters, we wrote about it in Handgutter not too long ago. Yeah. You know, we, if you have a box of holsters, that's good. That means you've been trying different things out. Yeah. What, that's what we always talk to our classes about. If you don't have a box or a drawer full of misfit holsters that you go to the store and you think I, this is the ultimate holster and you try it and it's just not okay. So you try something else or they, you use them so much, you love them to death. They go away. So anybody that's been shooting for a while really should have that, that drawer of holsters someplace. Well, and it's, and it varies by person, right? I mean, yeah. what's ultimate for you may not be for me and that's okay. You know, exactly. Cause I'm, I'm an, a lot more fit than you are, you know, more fit and handsome and you, you know, put, start adding those factors together. And he wrote a book too. So. And I wrote but, a book. Yeah. yeah. But I'm meaner and more bitter. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> fair uh, point, fair point. So yeah. we've seen the people who they'll spend 800 or a thousand dollars on a new SIG. And then they turn around and they ask the guy at the gun store, what's it, you know, what's, how much is a holster? And the, he'll say, well, there's this $25 nylon shapeless holster, uh, you know, or there's this $100 one, you know, made by fill in the blank company. And they almost always will buy the $20 holster. Yeah. Uh, I remember in some classes I went to at Thunder Ranch and Gunsight and places like that. And invariably there'd be some Nimrod show up on day one with a $12, you know, sewn Chinese holster. And of course, after being suitably, you know, bombarded with, with ridicule, usually day two, he'll, he'll be showing up with some borrowed holster that some guy, you know, yeah. gave to him. But, but let's talk about off-body carry because people always talk about holsters. And I, I, I don't think any of us here is going to say, you know, this, you need to buy this holster. That's not what this is about. Mm-hmm. I think this is right. about just think about it. Ask your friends, ask trusted people, read our magazines because we talk about holsters a lot. Uh, but, but just be thinking about what your needs are. And it's almost like computers and software because people used to always say, remember when early days of computers, they used to say, what computer should I buy? And yeah. then I would always say, well, what software do you need? And then you buy the computer that fits the software. And so in your own cases, you look at what are your needs to carry, and then you start looking for a holster to meet those needs. And maybe those needs are off-body carry. Yep. And I'll jump right in here with my, my one invention, a flexible water bottle. Um, it was designed to meet my needs. We, <laughs> a few pounds ago and a few years ago, we used to backpack a lot and it was hard to carry a firearm because obviously on your hip, the, the hips, uh, the yeah. back strap is rubbing it. Um, shoulder holster doesn't work. There's not a lot of good options and I'm a firm believer you should carry, but you should carry concealed. So I was trying to figure out a way to do this. And it struck me that by taking my water bottle, taking the guts out and you, as you can see, there's no water bottle there. I chopped it off, put a piece of, uh, core plast and then I've got a foam insert down here in which I stuck a small holster and that's where my 40 rode on my backpack hip belt He's and a sneak huh I, uh, that's exactly what that. it was that's yeah. kind of clever we, we actually discussed that for a while but it was so cool because you know you didn't run into trouble too often but every once in a while when you're miles and miles and miles in the backcountry and you run across somebody that's a little sketchy 
you know, I'd kind of just keep my hand on my hip, ready to get a drink of water. And they were never the wiser. And my hand was inches from my pistol. So <laughs> it just, it's a, not that I'm brilliant. It was just a, a cool example. I thought of how you can design things to meet the needs that you have. You know, Max Spedition has a, a line of packs that just look like everyday packs, like you'd carry your books to school with, and they're intentionally made to not look tactical. Uh, yep. And but yet they do have easily accessible uh, gun things. Now I'm not the I'm not the firmest believer in have your gun off your body somewhere because invariably you'll put your pack down over there and then that's when you need something. But if you're out of options or like in your case, Brent, I think that made perfect sense. Uh, there's also remember the old fanny packs. I actually helped to develop one for Bianchi in the early years. And, but then everybody started doing it. And then now it's like the photojournalist vest. They look down, they go, Hey, what kind of gun do you have? Uh, <laughs> but I think even if you go there, I notice they're starting to come back now. It's just think, think non-tactical. Just don't be a tact heart. I mean, get something that's forest green with, you know, that says REI on it. Yeah. This is now this one looks a little tactical, but this is a hill people gear chest rig. And this is perfect for backpacking and fishing and all that. So, uh, you know, like I said, it does look a little tactical, but I always make a kind of a, you know, I grab my, uh, when I'm talking to people, I get some jerky or if I'm fly fishing, I pull my fly box out and most people think, oh, he's just got a chest pack to carry his gear, not knowing there's a full size Glock right behind it. Hiking or in the woods, that doesn't look unusual at all. Exactly. Hmm. But Roy, there's another one, like you were describing for uh, in-town use, the um, uh, guys at VanQuest gear. Oh Yeah. Yeah. They make a whole new, they call it a, a urban series of uh, packs. And one of their specialties is sling packs that rotate around, you know, quickly and have a, um, a dedicated holster pocket too. But the new stuff looks, looks like a, a Metro book bag, you know, it does. Very, and have you seen the ones that they look like a tennis racket pack or they look like yeah. a <laughs> skateboard pack or, you know, I mean, that's made for like, if you've got an undercover police unit, they need to get into a building armed it just looks like a bunch of <laughs> undercover cops carrying inappropriate <laughs> backpacks. <laughs> a funny story when we were on SWAT and we wanted to do kind of an undercover type thing in insertion when we had maybe a, a trial going down that we needed to be there, but we didn't want to make a big show out of it. I play guitar, so my guitar case had a carbine in it, which what sense does that make a guy that looks like me and a bunch of other guys that look like me carrying a guitar and a, a keyboard case into the courthouse? <laughs> it really didn't make much sense, but <laughs> okay. It's the, it's the, it's the cop jazz band. <laughs> exactly. What do you guys think of these? This is a, a, I think the name is Excalibur. It's a Kydex basically clip that goes over the trigger guard and I know people carry these at holsters. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. The reason I have them is if you are going to carry off body in a, a pack or something that doesn't have a dedicated holster, I like this little bit of added safety that something won't get caught into your trigger guard, uh, a chapstick or whatever, a jerky uh, won't get caught in your trigger guard and have a, uh, a, a boo-boo. But these aren't very expensive and it gives a little bit of extra peace of mind. Well, you know, a long time ago when I was doing my handgun leather column, I had a reader send me some pictures and it was, it was a uh, uh, pair of jeans and it was obvious there were powder burns and you could see the hole blown out where the jean pocket was. And uh, so I sent him a note back and I said, you know, tell me what happened here. And he had a, an old, uh, the kel P32, the little, you know, pocket, mm -hmm. P32. He had that carried loosely in his right front pocket, but in that pocket was a Swiss army knife, one of the little executive Swiss army knives. And yeah. so, and, it, but his gun wasn't in a holster and, and he was, as he was walking out to a gas pump to pump gas in his car from paying inside when we used to have to do that, he said, I heard a pop. He said, <laughs> and I felt cool. My leg was like cool all of a sudden, you know, he says, and I, I couldn't figure out what the noise was. I thought somebody threw a firecracker or something. He says, I looked down and I saw the hole in my pocket. He says, and I, it dawned on me what had happened. He said, so I just like, you know, put my hand in my pocket, got in my car and drove away. So who knows where the bullet went or anything, but he's, excuse me. He said what he found out though, is that the knife had worked its way into the trigger guard. Yeah. And when he, when he moved, it had actually pulled the trigger and, and it fired in his pocket. Interestingly enough, he said it cycled and it reloaded a cartridge. And really? The, yeah, the knife was still stuck in the trigger guard. So Wow. Th that was like... He was lucky. Never for me ever will I put a gun in my pocket. Yeah. 
That's requirement one, protect the trigger. Yeah. You know, that raises a a a funny observation I never thought about, but in all of the pictures or maybe personal experience you've had where people have accidentally shot themselves, and I don't mean in the leg, in the body, but a uh, discharge, like it's in the holster is their holstering or, or in a pocket or whatever. They always yeah. do the same thing. They try to act like it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it. Through. No, yep. everything's, everything's yeah. fine. Uh, you have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. The famous one was the, uh, I believe it was a DEA agent <laughs> given the gun safety talk oh. and he shot himself. He's like, yeah. Nope, I'm fine. I've got arterial bleeding, but I am fine. I'm a professional. He kind of tried to continue on with his lecture, too. Yeah, exactly. People are screaming. It's it's so, I mean, that was a a negligent thing, but it's so unnecessary. I remember Plaxico Burris shot himself in the leg, the NFL receiver, or tight end, I think he was. Um, He wasn't using a holster at all. And, you know, the gun started to slip down his pants and, you know, lunged for it. It's like, stop it from falling, you know, through his pants leg to the floor and shot himself in the leg. Well, what are the firearm safety rules? You know, think, keep your finger off the trigger, you know, muzzle in a safe direction. And if you're carrying a gun, the muzzle is going to cross your thigh or it's going to cross your appendix or it's going to, so you got to yeah. protect that trigger. I yeah. have, uh, I, I collect some old classic law enforcement holsters I used to use for photos for my columns and stuff. And I have one, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it now, but it was a, a holster that had a, it was a police holster and it was a clamshell holster that if you, you put your finger in the trigger guard and push the button and the whole side of the holster right. would flip open. Right. So, and that was just, you know, in the late forties, I guess is about yeah. when they first came out. LAPD used to carry them. As a matter of fact, Adam 12 used to use that. <laughs> really? If you watch that, yeah, they put, the, they just put their hand on their gun. Yeah. Push the button, flip the holster would open up. But so I have one for a 1911. And very interestingly, at the very bottom of the holster, because it was steel lined, there's a perfect 45 caliber hole going right through the bottom of the holster. So things were exciting at some point for some officer. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I just thought of another uh, do as I say, not as I do moment. And I don't know if I've written about it in guns. I've written about it elsewhere. Okay. So setting the scene, we're doing a plain clothes detail. We're taking care of these bad guys. We're out doing stuff at night. And uh, since I'm young and, you know, full of testosterone. I thought, uh, I'm not going to use the name cause I'm not sure what's politically correct now, but I stuck it in my waistband. That's it. There's various names for that, but I, you know, Hey, we're, we're, we're BA, we're, we're tough. We can carry guns like that. So didn't have any problem that night, got home and I went to pull my full size Glock out of my waistband and it wouldn't come. And I mean, it'd move a little bit. And the more I, what happened was the uh, slide lock had somehow engaged the waistband of my underwear. There was a tiny tear (laughs) and it engaged that to where I basically gave myself the wedgie from hell trying to pull my handgun. So I got all that sorted out, but I thought, wouldn't that have been wonderful if I'd got into a deep crisis and I'm sitting there pulling my underwear out of my pants. Cause you know, with adrenaline, it, it would have come, but I, I, that would have scared anybody away. Well, exa- um, well that's true. <laughs> it was and, underwear hanging from the muzzle of his Glock. Right. <laughs> I would, I would have run. So, <laughs> and they probably wouldn't have been clean. <laughs> no. You know, if it's not a DA auto, if you, if it's a essentially single action, you can call them double action. That's fine. I don't care. care. But if it's a, a Glocky, you know, kind of a gun, uh, M and P kind of a gun with no safety. It's just a, a little flipper safety. You, you're crazy if you just if you don't have a holster around that. No. And that's one reason why actually I like XD pistols, uh, because the, the the genre of XDs with a grip safety. I mm-hmm. mean it, it it does lend you had you know to be a little bit safer in that situation. But before we get too far off topic, though, Tom, I wanted you to talk about. Uh, we joke about him writing the book on, but he really did. And I really yeah. would like you to tell the listeners a little bit, what, what would they learn if they got your book? Because I think it's a good resource. I think the, the first thing I would say is we gun people tend to be really binary. Like this method is great. That method is stupid, period. And I don't buy that at all. We're all different. We all have different requirements. I never will rarely have to wear a long dress to work. Right. So, so I can carry IWB, but you know, I can't sit there and say, well, you know, you must carry IWB because it's the only correct way. Well, that's easy for me to say, right? I mean, it's a silly example, but, but it kind of drove how I approached the book. I went through a whole bunch of different carry methods, you know, 
outside the waistband, inside, ankle, off body, packs, shirts, clothing, underwear, you know, you name it. And instead of saying, this is great and this is lousy, and sometimes I would say I think it's lousy, but more importantly, I think you have to look at the pros and cons relative to your requirements and lifestyle. So, you know, if you have to carry in an ankle, uh, here are the pros and cons. It's going to generally take you two hands to get it out. You know, it's a slower, more awkward thing. It's pretty far out of the way. Uh, but if you know that and you recognize the limitations and you you consciously think through those trade-offs, uh, maybe that's right for you. I mean, that's just one example. But but the whole point is you've really got to look and, and recognize what you're getting into. You know, I, I talked about shirt carry earlier. Um, that's a real easy trade-off. It's really, really concealable. Uh, if you're in an environment where you absolutely positively have to keep concealed, maybe it's a a work environment where it's not illegal, but it's frowned upon. Um, maybe that's your only choice. Now I would recognize I cannot get to it as quickly as I could another method. So if I turn a corner and somebody punches me in the face, I'm probably not going to have a lot of success drawing my gun to prevent that. Right. That's the cost. Right? And that goes back to maybe part of holster carry is also learning, honing your situational awareness, like yeah. with the ankle carry thing. I think at least with ankle carry, you'd never violate that rule one of a gunfight, which is have a gun, you know, yeah. so ultimately yep. it's some, if you're forewarned, then you're forearmed. And so then, you know, I'm a duck behind this car and get my gun out of my holsters. You just, you just have to think, you know, you have to, you have to look at the methods, you have to think of the pros and cons and only then, and this is what I do in the book, only then do you get into the specific gear. So, you know, when we talk about ankle carry, we talk about, you know, a dozen different options, you know, to do that and pros and cons within those. So, so you really have to take a strategic layered approach to how you're going to carry and why you're going to carry. You know, there was one holster we didn't cover the Brazier uh -oh. holster flashbang, the huh? flashbang. Do you remember Tom? Are we qualified to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we almost filmed a piece at shot show. If you remember, I think it was us. We one of us was going to model the flashbang, but we decided oh, no, that, that no, might no, be a little no, silly. No. Well, you know, sometimes I want to feel pretty. Well, I think that's a situation, <laughs> though. Like Tom said, maybe in certain situations that might be appropriate. I don't know. I can't say. You know, I, and I'm being being serious here. I don't have that challenge. You know, I don't have that wardrobe <laughs> challenge. I don't have. You know, so. Well, you know, I, I've I've known a couple of women that have to make some pretty dramatic. Uh, accommodations to carry because it's exactly like you said, Tom, that uh, they're not committing a crime by carrying a gun, but they would be fired and their career would be instantly ruined if somebody yeah. thought they had a gun, but yet they're not going to go to work without one. So right. that's one of those situations where it may be a little slower getting out, but you've, you're relatively safe that nobody's going to uh, see it inadvertently and you're going to end up losing your career over it. It's, it's a spectrum. And, and the easy way to look at it is, is kind of speed of accessibility, <laughs> you know, versus concealment. And it's a seesaw, right? So, yep. You know, uh, my wife, Susie, when she was a detective, they had to dress nicely in the office and whatnot. And so, of course, if you're a woman and you don't, they don't really have big belts, you know, if you're wearing a dress skirt or pantsuits or something. So she actually experimented with uh, real lightweight uh, shoulder holster systems mm -hmm. and, with a, a smallish, small to medium sized gun, and then balance the other side with a, a magazine or two. And uh, she found that it actually worked out really well because she got in the office, she could just take it off, hang it on the, you know, the chair behind her. Uh, she said the only problem was with a woman's lighter weight shirts, it tended to, you know, scrunch the shirts, you know, wow. out because she's got, you know, silky shirts or, or that kind of stuff. So, uh, but we didn't talk about uh, shoulder holsters, but I will say I used to carry one all, a lot, but you have to remember you can't take your coat off. And so, you know, that throws a wrench in things. Yeah. I would say if I had to say one thing about holster carry is that like, I think Tom covered it very well with the book and is that, you know, take a hard look at all of the options, but just don't scrimp on quality. That is the thing. Just don't go cheap because you will regret it. Uh, kind of semi-related to the quality. We didn't necessarily talk about this directly yet. I, I like to kind of consider the drop test, you know, do it with an unloaded handgun. But, you know, if you put a gun in a holster and shake it and it falls right out the bottom, uh, 
I, I know it's easy to say, you know, you guys told some some law enforcement stories where you're fighting or subduing a suspect, but but reasonable retention applies to the civilian world every bit as much. Absolutely. Um, if you're attacked or fighting for your life, you're in vigorous movement. So uh, that needs to stay where it's supposed to stay until you choose to, to take it out. Um, even running, <laughs> running or jogging with a cheap holster, you know, that gun's going to come out. So think about retention. Uh, a lot of times we get readers say, hey, I have a 38 revolver. What holster should I buy? And it's just not a that holster. simple. Yeah. yeah, it's just not that. And hopefully, even if that's all I think anyone's learned from this is that, you know, we are we arguably experts. I think an expert is someone who knows more than the average guy. So we might qualify. I don't know. Uh, I have the biggest box of holsters that didn't work for me. So that may help a little bit. But yeah. I think one thing that I've learned through the years is that there is no definitive answer. And like one of you said, we tend to be it's good or bad. And that's just, this is one of those categories where that's yep. just not the case. It's yeah. Just what's good for me is bad for you is good for Brent is bad for, you know, this other guy. So exactly. Yeah. Good point. Well, great, great uh, discussion over holsters, the good and bad of, and the ugly. I think we've all kind of agreed, get a good holster, make sure it, it serves your needs and don't be afraid to throw it in the box in the garage. <laughs> and yeah. and check out Tom's book. How, how can people find out about that book, Tom? Uh, the e easiest way to find it, well, any any of the big booksellers, uh, Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, iBooks, it's available in ebook and print. It's called The Practical Guide to Gun Holsters for Concealed Carry. I hope you got some great information during our quick hit discussion on holsters. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Please tell all your friends, even the liberals. Guns Magazine is number one in the business, and we're using our decades of friendships to bring you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you have questions, comments, or a guest you'd like to recommend for the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you don't miss out on anything by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast directory and YouTube. Of course, you can always listen and download our episodes at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're at it, don't forget to check out our sister publication, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com. I'd also be personally very grateful if you'd consider subscribing to one or both print magazines so the free flow of firearms information can continue regardless of what the big tech companies think. And finally, before we go, I'd like to remind you to check out our sponsor and friend, Kimber Firearms at KimberAmerica.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire crew at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. <laughs>